Okay, everybody, so let's get started. Hold on one moment. So um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the education coordinator at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center, a national landmark uh, located in East Hampton, approximately 100 miles east of New York City. And we do have changing exhibitions in the home and the historic home. And we have a wonderful exhibition on display right now, Harold Lehman in the 1930s. It will be up through October 30th. And you can visit in, in real life if you're in the area, sign up in advance for a tour. Go to pkhouse.org to, to sign up to see that exhibit. Um, but today we have, and I'm doing this program remotely right now from my home. So we really have a very special guest today, Lisa Traeger. She's the daughter of Harold Lehman. And I met Lisa at the opening and I was very fortunate to connect with her and her family. And I was so impressed by some of the personal stories and insights Lisa had into her father's work. And um, not just the history behind the work, but really his commitment to social justice through his art and how he persevered through some circumstances that most people would consider very difficult. Living in the 1930s was not an easy time, of course, um, and also his personal story, but he, he persevered through the many opportunities that he grabbed hold of, um, which supported artists during that era. So um, what we're gonna do is, I'm go today we're focusing on murals. So I'll give you a little introduction to Pollock and Krasna's murals, and then I'll show you a short clip of the installation, and then we're going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to discuss Harold Lehman's um, Man's Daily Bread, and she'll tell you more about that. It's a very uh, important mural, and it's really interesting to look at, too, you, just the imagery. It's a little mysterious. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm going to do a little screen share. Okay, so um, there is the barn studio, which is at the National Landmark. Jackson Pollock, of course, is best known for his drip painting. And uh, Lee Krasner, his wife, was also a very important abstract express art, expressionist artist. And um, this of course is Pollock's style that he's best known for his iconic drip painting, 100% abstract, often very large scale, dripping paint from sticks instead of actually using a paintbrush. So we're gonna touch upon today, where did this idea come from? Of course, there were many influences and today we're gonna see Pollock's connection to the great Mexican muralist Siquerios. So let's begin at the beginning. Pollock is studying with Thomas Hart Benton, who's one of the most um, important American muralists. You can see this, this historic mural, mural at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, it tells about the various facets of American life um, with a focus um, on the worker. And here is Pollock actually on the lower right. He used to pose for Thomas Hart Benton's murals. And um, he was strongly influenced by Benton. He was studying with him at the Art Students League. And later in his life, Pollock says, Benton was a, um, a, per a difficult personality to react against. So he be go goes beyond the style of Benton, which is narrative, this recognizable images, it's telling history, right? It's storytelling, it's excellent storytelling. It's also art for the people with a very clear message. So this is what Pollock's painting would have looked like in the 1930s. So how does Pollock go from this kind of painting to abstraction? Well, um, you, I think you'll see that as this unfolds. So both Jackson Pollock and Lee were employed by the WPA, which was the federal art pro program, which employed artists full-time with a living wage. And Lee and Pollock mostly assisted on murals. Um, and these are two examples. On the left is Pollock's mosaic, which was um, 
it's not exactly a mural. It is, it's mobile, you know, it's, it's movable. Um, and it was never permanently installed. Now it's in the estate. And to the right is Lee Krasner's uh, painting for a mural that was also never actually installed and completed. Now, um, Harold Lehman was also, and I'm sorry, I think I just mispronounced that, um, was also employed by the WPA, which was really, I think it was one of the greatest programs for artists in the history of America. Lee also reported it was equal wages for men and women, although I think there was a slight discrepancy. And she was really inspired by that program to, as a, a give back. Later on in her life, she created her own foundation to help young artists financially. Now Pollock was um, commissioned by Peggy Guggenheim, the wealthy heiress, to make a mural for her home. And uh, Peggy Guggenheim also gave Pollock a monthly stipend so he could paint. And um, he, she also gave Pollock and Lee a, um, excuse me, a loan for the down payment on the house. So they moved from New York City to East Hampton. But when Pollock created the mural for Peggy, he was working in a small apartment in New York City and the family recalls that he had to break down a wall to even fit it into the apartment. And they used to sneak out in the middle of the night to get rid of the debris from the wall and discard it because you're not allowed to break down walls in apartment buildings. But at any rate, here you see Pollock's work becoming much looser, more fluid, more gestural, certainly more abstract, right? You see the artist's mark, you see the dripping, a little dripping, a little smearing, and you clearly see the gesture of Jackson Pollock, right? It might remind you of figures or creatures or a procession, but it sort of is on the edge of abstraction with a little representation. And eventually this gives way to his drip painting, which I hope you can see if you do go to the Met or the Museum of Modern Art. So Pollock was very strongly influenced by the Mexican muralist, the great, great muralists of that era, Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siquerios. I'm not gonna go into that today in depth because I'm giving another Zoom talk, which you're welcome to come back to on September 27, okay? But one of the most important figures is Siquerios, and this dovetails with our discussion today about Harold Lehman, which I've learned so much recently that Harold Lehman was really very instrumental in the success of C. Kediosis experimental workshop in New York City. My understanding is that C. Kedios could not get a lease in New York City to um, host this workshop. And my understanding is that Lehman actually signed the lease for the building, for the physical space. Lehman also recruited Jackson Pollock and many other artists to participate in what's called the experimental workshop. So C. Kedios was a muralist. He was highly political and he was anti-fascist. He was a communist and his life was really devoted to, to pro-worker and to um, getting across a message in art, anti-authoritarian and defying what the status quo would have been for these, these powerful institutions. So here we see tropical America, where you see in the center, really it's an indigenous person on a crucifix with the American Eagle above the, the crucifix. This was commissioned and it was whitewashed over because it was communist and it was objected to by the authorities of the United States. Many of these murals were censored. And I understand Harold Lehman's early murals that he created with the block painters, as they were called, with David Alfaro Siquieros were destroyed by the police without notice, without any warning whatsoever. So this is a talk about censorship um, as much as it is about art in general. So Siquieros comes to the, um, New York and he, he creates this experimental workshop. It's art for the people, making floats and parades, all anti-fascist 
messages. And Pollock works with him, as does Lehman. And um, many of these works don't exist anymore. So Sikirios was all about experimentation with materials, using modern materials instead of traditional materials. This was a political act of rebellion for Sikirios. And here is where Pollock would have learned unconventional techniques like dripping and uh, marbleizing and using stencils, putting sand into the uh, paint, um, using at times non-art paint like automotive paint and lacquer to create this marbleizing technique. And even using surfaces that are not art materials such as this painting was done on plywood rather than canvas. So Sikirios's artwork like this one has a political message. It's about a horrible battle where the indigenous people killed themselves rather than submitting to the Spanish conquistadors. But for Pollock, this process is much more personal. It's experimentation and openness with paint for a personal expression, right? Jackson Pollock is an abstract expressionist. He says, I want to express my feelings. So you can see gradually Pollock becomes more open with his paint. It's a physical release of energy. It's actually energy made visible. Now, Lee Krasner, um, she created, she, as I said, she was also employed by the WPA. And this mural was created with her nephew, Ronald Stein. It's a mosaic. And it is outside of the building in Manhattan at the Uris Brothers building. And it was created in 1959. Now, clearly this kind of mural has a completely different purpose than Lehman's mural or other murals we've discussed today. There's nothing political about it. Mural making can also beautify, right? It's art for the people. Everyone that can walk by this mural can enjoy abstract art. You no longer have to go into a museum to partake in art. And that is why personally I love murals. They're often public and it changes the way we look at the world, either through a message or as I said, by creating aesthetic beauty. So on that note, I'm gonna um, show you the installation that we have today. Um, we do have this wonderful installation with a very large reproduction of Harold Lehman's mural called Man's Daily Bread. And um, I will, Lisa will go into more detail about the mural and how it came about, but bear with me. I just, I'm not a professional videographer. I walked around with my phone, <laughs> okay? This is not a professional video, disclaimer. So, but I think it gives you an idea of the space. May I talk over your video? Yeah, that would be really good. Yeah, thank you. So this is a self-portrait that my father did of himself during the time he was in Los Angeles. Um, that painting and the other details that are in the exhibit are owned by the Wolfsonian. This is the Man's Daily Bread mural, which at the time was created for the Rikers Island Penitentiary. And what you're seeing here are details he did before and um, before the mural so that he could start really developing the themes of the different characters that are in that mural. All of these paintings, as I said, were, were purchased by Mitchell Wolfson back in, I guess, the 80s. And they use the same fresco technique, which is what gives them, a, I think, a warmth and, and a um, intimacy that often you won't find in just regular oil paint. Um, these are, are paintings that also went on display um, in different venues, including the Whitney Museum. And, um, and for me, 
it was really, really emotional seeing the, this work because I hadn't seen it for years, you know, since I was a teenager growing up. Now this, um, the skull is interesting because um, here's, the, here's what it was based on. My father was a poor starving artist and he was approached by a doctor to do a commission. The doctor wanted a skeleton, wanted a skull. So he knew that his friend Jackson had a skull that he could borrow. <laughs> and, and that's how the painting was made. Um, I think that while when I'm doing my presentation, Joy, I'll go slower in some of the details from the website mm -hmm. to give the audience great. more mm -hmm. chance. And then these are like that's um these are artists and these are, are drawings that he did in Los Angeles while he was a, an apprentice to Siqueiros. Now, I, I, I won't be able to pronounce the name as you did, Joyce. I've spent my whole life pronouncing it Siqueiros. So I apologize. Me too, um, Lisa. But these, these are all, um, the drawings are from Los Angeles during the period just after he went to manual arts high school with Jackson Pollock. Okay. That's how they know each other. They were, they were buddies and they actually met as um, artists who were more interested in sculpture. Both my father and Pollock started as sculptors and um, they, they had a, a close friendship in which they hung out together. Pollock um, ended up introducing my father to his girlfriend and um, and the they they stayed in a rooming house and there was an even rented um, his his room from Pollock's girlfriend's landlord <laughs> landlady. Okay, so there was all sorts of connections. Um, the one story I love is how my father taught Pollock how to play the harmonica, <laughs> and um, which was a lot of fun for, for them back in high school. Shall I delve now more deeply into the topic of, of the murals? I think that would be wonderful. Okay. So I'm sitting in my living room. Behind me are some artwork. Um, done by my father. And um, I'm very blessed to be the executor of his estate. We switch up the artwork. We have our own little exhibit in the living room here that changes by the season. So we still have the summer work up. <laughs> and excuse me one moment. I want, because I said it at the beginning, but I want to make sure everyone knows. This is Lisa Traeger. This is an honor to have Lisa Traeger, um, Harold Lehman's daughter. Thank you so much. So, um, so I learned about my father's life, um, really from my uh, his professional life. That is, about twenty five years ago, when I was making a transition from a career in television to the internet and web. And um, back in you know 19, in the early nineteen nineties, a lot of people didn't know much about the internet or web what a website was but I was learning how to do it. In fact, I took a six week course at NJIT, which back then you could learn everything about the web in six weeks. <laughs> and I went to my father and I said, I wanna do a website about you. And he's, what's a website? I said, oh, it's great. I'll be able to, sh to show your artwork and I'll be able to tell the story of your life. So um, so the first iteration of this site was done with and for my dad. I'm gonna share the screen now. Thank you, Lisa. Everyone, I do encourage you to visit this website. Will you give us, what is the uh, name? What's the, the what's the yes. address? It's just- um, Harold Very simply, it's haroldlayman.com. And I do invite you all to come to the site. So, um, so the website covers all the different chapters of his life and different styles of painting. Um, but this image over here is really how I remember my father best in his studio at work and um, always 
creating artwork from the people and the things around him. But we're here to talk about mural art. And so as you can see, and I do encourage you to go to the website because it talks about all the different phases of his life. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do another webinar, which is a tribute to my dad on October 12th, which I hope you all um, find time to come back to where I'm going to give a little bit more in-depth um, information about my dad and, and what I think may, makes his story really unique. Right now, let's talk about his involvement um, as a mural artist. He actually started, his first mural was in Los Angeles where he created a mural with Ruben Kadish and Phil Gustin who were other buddies of his at this Frank Wiggins trade school. And they didn't know a lot about what a mural was. They didn't, they, they all had worked with Cicados and they were part of block of painters and they were very influenced by the fact that this art you know was um one which was very majestic in terms of the way that that the uh, um topics were related and so they applied for the first federal program and this was the first mural that they worked on the section on the right was done by my father. The section on the left was done by Ruben Kadish. And this was done in 1934. Unfortunately, their, their technique was not really locked down and there were a lot of technical problems with the mural. So, um, so they, they were replaced actually by Leo Katz. And Leo Katz was a famous artist who had come east and he was teaching at, at um, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the, the school, but he, oh, he came to teach and that's when he was assigned to take over. Katz ended up doing this mural, which was also then um, <laughs> really a, a very controversial mural for a high school. And this mural was eventually destroyed as well because they just would not tolerate this imagery. Again, very revolutionary, very sexual, um, somewhat violent um, to be in a high school trade school. <laughs> so what happened then was that my father went back East to New York and um, around the same time as when Siqueiros came East to attend um, a Congress, American Artist Congress, and together they put together the Siqueiros workshop. Now the workshop, the, the objective was not to necessarily create art, but to more create these installations that were used for these big rallies. And um, the rallies were, uh, were in support of the the war effort and anti-fascist. So this is an example of the May Day float. And this is where my father first came up with one of the earlier statements, which I love. The basic thing about mural painting is that it's a message that the artist is giving to the public. And in turn, the message must be received by the public. This kind of give and take is an extremely important and valuable one to both the social and artistic life of this country. So that's when they started applying a lot of these techniques of mural painting to these installations. And the one thing that I wanna bring up here is like a detail he did, a gouache study he did on board for the actual float that they created. And um, I find that it, there is a certain degree of humor with these two, all of these, even though it was political, you know, the fact that they have this, this um, fist, like, like a, a punchy, a, a glove from, from boxing, punching Hitler in the nose, okay? Um, and they did things like that. And, and Joyce showed before this, um, this other float and the fact that, that Pollock was 
part of the workshop. In fact, he reported to my dad. Um, and and it's it's clear that these accidental images were ones that the workshop did. And it is undisputed that without this kind of experience, chances are the nature of Pollock's work might not have gone in that exact direction, but he was truly inspired by what he saw and experienced in the workshop. So after this, and, and here again is, is Pollock. So after, after this experience is when he, when the federal art program really went into, they were, they were seeking artists who had the technique and they, um, you know, you really had to prove that you, you knew what you were doing to be part of the WPA. So um, in fact, initially, Ben Sean was chosen to do this Rikers Island mural. The fact is, is that his mural was based on more like penal reform. And so when the administrators, when they, when the authorities saw the initial sketches, they were horrified by, you know, the idea that, oh my goodness, this entire mural, you know, this entire experience is going to just show, you know, uh, prisoners in various states of torture replete with chain gangs and police lineups, <laughs> you know. So when my father submitted his proposal, which was man's daily bread, it was one that was much more um, akin to this, this, actually there was a lot of penal reform being done. And back in the day in the 1930s, Rikers Island was seen as a progressive institution. It was seen as a place to where they were doing things to try and bring rehabilitation to the prisoners. That was their number one objective back in, in the early days. They even had farms and, and I think a tree farm and different things for prisoners to learn different evocations that they could take when they, when they left the prison. So this, and I, I think that what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just magnify this a little bit more while I, while I read. You can see it okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So my father said, I came up with this theme, Man's Daily Bread, because the mural was in the mess hall of Rikers Island Prison, where eight to 900 prisoners ate three times a day. So it seemed to me that Athene had some connection with not only handling food, but the idea of earning one's bread by one's own sweat, so to speak would have some good constructive connection with that prison without being an obvious lecture. So in his, in his proposal, and in fact, over here, we can even go to the, to the proposal. You know, he's talking about, about the, the characteristics of the wall. He's talking about the themes the objective factors. Now, this was huge. It was a hundred. Um, it was it was seventy feet by twenty feet. Uh, you know, seventy feet across by twenty feet high. And so, my father did a lot of research in doing his proposal. Not the least of which was um, approaching the psychiatrist at Elmira Prison. His, his brother, his twin brother was a social worker there. And he had reached out to his brother to help him understand what all the psychological um, uh, implications of having this kind of mural, what would, what would help to, uh, what would inspire these prisoners? What would be something that, that would really work psychologically? With, with the prisoners, not just it being decorative. So this, this long essay talks about, about all of it. And, and let me read here. On the left, as one views the wall, in fact, I'll go back to this so you can see it. Let 
Let me see. Yeah, I have some of the details here of this. So on the left, maybe it's better to see the whole thing. Let me go back up. Ah, no, sorry it was good. That. Well, so that was good too, Lisa, if you want to show okay. the detail, either way. Okay, so on the left is when views the wall, you'll see the activities of food production devoted to planting, growing, harvesting basic food materials. And on the right will be presented scenes of coal and iron mining, cutting of lumber, securing other raw materials. These will show the taking from the earth in order to build. Again, constructive activity. These two converge towards the center of the wall, right in the middle here, and progress into the third, which, which portrays the development of the types of raw material, food and minerals for consumption. So here you have the bakery, um, you know, the baking the bread and then the refinery. They are of course symbols of labor. It is through labor that men secure the means to obtain life's necessities. So he was really intent on doing something that the prisoners would relate to. I found it fascinating in reading this again, I hadn't really picked up on this before, is his use of color. Color will be used as an integral part of the idea in each section. So he, he goes on to say that in accordance with the progression of, of growth, the color will begin cool and become increasingly warmer until in the harvesting part, it shall have become a symphony of reds, yellows, browns, russets, and orange, fall colors. This will also help give the suggestion of time from early spring to fall. So I just love that idea that he really took into account not only you know the the theme of work but even then how you know how you need to invest time to make progress to to improve one's life and that and um he used the physical characteristics of the actual wall and doors themselves you'll see here here's the door but he continues the design this way and he uses the physical attributes in the actual design of the mural itself. In another essay, he talks about his approach to, to mural painting. And I think this is also quite relevant. He talks about one must, an artist must never forget that a mural is a social experience whereby he must communicate with other men. Well, of course, back then everything was men with men. <laughs> so so it, it sounds a little up, outdated for today, but the fact is it's about communication. It's about telling a story. And he talks about the psychological factors. So you need to consider the purpose, the nature of the building, the relation to the architecture and the space, the personality or the type of people that are frequenting the building. The time factors, will they see it in a glance, like riding a subway, or will it be a more sustained experience, such as a mural in a hospital or a library or prison where people are looking at this over time? He says, I don't understand when people say to me, but a mural is a plane, two dimensions. What these people, what these people, um, I'm sorry, my, I made a typo here is, um, a, a mural space is not frozen surface. It is a plastic moving space that becomes what the spectator's eye make it at any given point, the perspective of the person and where they are viewing it. And when he was doing the Rikers Island mural, what he, he was talking about form and subject, the psychological factors, but also the fact that when he was design, he was doing it with different ideas of, okay, up here, you're gonna be seeing it from the floor. Whereas these figures here, you can literally stand up and see it at eye level. And he was considering all of these different physical factors of, of 
of the wall itself. So again, I do invite you to come to, to view the website. You can read in detail a lot of the, um, his, his thinking, his theories. I think it's, it's fascinating that a lot of what he's saying is relevant to today. And that, and that in fact, the last thing he talks about in his he, he wrote this um, essay really for, for a speech he gave at the Artists' Union. But he said, he said that it's really important to, to realize that, that we don't want to just stick with one approach to this that mural art in order for it to be relevant has got to change with the way that artists and people see art as well. And, um, and I think that that was very perceptive, you know, that, that this is something that in order for it, in fact, the, the artists, the, the artists union came to him because they were very concerned that after the thirties, how would they continue having mural art since there was lack of funding and there was an interest in having artists like my father make a, a um, be able to show corporations how they could use this in their own architecture in order to continue this, this type of art in the future. So um, what I will do now is just because we went through a lot of the details very quickly before. Let me see if I can get here. So, so my father also did another mural and a friend of mine, Dave Lembeck, he did a show on the post office murals of Pennsylvania. He'll be talking on October 19th. So this was another mural he did in 41, 42. And this one was under the section of fine arts. But he always did a lot of research and he always went and interviewed, in this case, he interviewed the men who were working on, on the railroad and, um, and he even put in realistic things like the buttons that the union members wore and um, and David has a lot of good good details to share about about this mural. Um, he did extensive research on the drill to make sure this was realistic. Um, but that's you know that's basically. And then after the mural period, then he he went on and he did a lot of work for the war effort and did a lot of war bond posters and things like that as well. In the end. Um, you know, he ended up being a scenic artist working in television and film. And um, and I guess I, I'm just very, very blessed that I had the opportunity to grow up in a family with with him as my father who who taught me so much. Um, and and really, I thought everyone's world was surrounded by art. And I soon learned growing up that that wasn't the case. So Joyce, is there anything else you'd like me to cover? No, Lisa, that was that was incredible as usual, honestly. That was just everybody, please let's give Lisa a round of applause. A Zoom round of applause. That was like Thank you. And the website, I'm I have to tell everybody really, I I don't know if you wrote who wrote the website, but it's so well done. It's like better. It's just, it's just really a story of someone's life. And you just want to go from one chapter and find out like, it's better than Netflix. No, I'm just kidding. You want to find out like what is going to happen next. So right. like, all these chapters, it's told in a narrative way, which makes it really easy to take in the information. Thank so you. Yeah, I did. I did. And, and that's how I learned my, my new career was writing this, as I said, back in 1994, 95, I learned how to do, create a website. 
I wrote all, everything. I did all the graphics. I did all the coding. And, um, and recently, over the last year or two, I updated the whole thing. And I dug even deeper and brought even more archival material to bear. So, um, so it, is, it is a story that keeps getting deeper and deeper. And you're right, Joyce. Um, I'm, I'm very seriously thinking about um, taking it the next step into more of a book. It's, it's, it, there's so much content, really. So we do have a question. Laura says, um, which is a very good question, Laura. What makes a mural a mural? Is it the size or other factors involved? That's a very good question. Do you want to answer that question, or I can well, let, me, let me let me let me let um, me try. I think what makes a mural different than a painting is the physical space that it's in, and that most murals are in one way or the other part of a wall. Now, let me say this: I, I neglected to mention this. Unfortunately, in the 1960s, the warden in charge of the Rikers Island Penitentiary decided that the mural had to go. And the Rikers Island mural was taken down and destroyed. Um, the, the reason why they were able to destroy it is because in this case, it was done on canvas affixed to the wall itself. And unfortunately, my father learned this. In fact, if I may, this is, I'm, I think that this is kind of apropos. To so, it, you know, it was really heartbreaking. My father says in his own words, nobody was told, nobody, nobody was given the opportunity to salvage it or do anything about it to save it. The way I found out was quite by accident. I merely wanted to see the state of preservation of my painting. In 1975, I made a trip to Rikers Island and found, lo and behold, an empty wall. This is the only way I found that my painting no longer existed. I had to go out there and discover this. You can imagine how heartbreaking this was. I can, yeah, I can imagine. And then, and the, also, Lisa, on the website, there's the story about how in the early days when, I don't know if they were murals or just large size paintings, when they were censored because they were um, considered to be communist and they, the police came in and destroyed oh, yeah, the yeah. And then your yeah. father comes to the gallery the next day thinking there's going to be an opening and the paintings are torn up. And yeah. the case actually went to court. Right. Right. And they lost the they lost the case though. Yeah, they did because these were these were and in fact the photographs I have are the only photographs of the block of painters who was supposed to be in the John Reed Club. And what they did was the LA Red Squad came and these were true frescoes. So they came with hammers and they literally destroyed. This was the one um let me move this out of the way. This is the one done by my father. And then this is the one done by Ruben Kadish. And this is by Louis Arenal. And um, yeah, I mean, it, you can imagine my father's repeated heartbreak over time and time again, having his work destroyed, you know, due to the political nature of it. Mm. So what, what's the difference between um, uh, what makes something a mural, I think, is the fact that it is part of the structure or the architecture or part of the wall of, of, of a building. And, and although these were known as portable frescoes and that they could be moved around, it was really the, the, the approach and that they weren't just done for decor decorative reasons for the most part. They were done with more, more idealism behind it. I don't know, Joyce, what do you think? I think also um, a traditional, that I think it's a really good question, Laura, so thank you. 
Um, yes, I agree 100%. A mural, technically, the definition is that it's done on a wall and it's actually part of the architecture. It's part of the building. Okay. Right. Traditionally, historically, right, murals were done with mosaics in cathedrals, murals were done with frescoes, which is a plaster technique. So Harold Lehman in those examples that you just gave, he's working with that traditional fresco technique. These modern painters expand the materials. So Siquerios, his murals sometimes are actually three dimensional or he's working with cement in his murals. Um, and also they're working with direct paint on a wall. Um, nowadays also some muralists use some kind of surface right? That's sort, not a fabric, but like a fabric, it, it moves, paints it on there, and then you can glue that to a wall. Right. Now, that's, that's how the Rikers Island was done. Okay. Yep. Yeah, which makes it obviously easier. You could also lay it flat. It's, 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 it's easier to approach. So it, it is true also with a mural that there's this physical aspect that you don't have to worry about as much with a painting. Now, like, for example, there's doors there. Right? Like it's it's part of a building. You design that into it. Now, right. if you're on a ladder, you know, you got to think about I'm going up on that ladder. What do I want to put? Just like Lisa said, way up at the top on them, all of these things. So does that answer your question, Laura? Yeah. OK, so let's see. Um, any other questions? I'm going to look at the chat. Oh, does it always does? Very good question. Does a mural always have a message for viewers? Lisa? Um, if you ask my father, um, I think he would say yes, that it's not just a message, it's really understanding who your audience is. So is, is it a worker who comes into the building every day? Is it a patient? Is it a prisoner? I think he, you know, we talk about usability in website um, industry, right? Well, he did a lot of the same kind of research and, and psychological understanding of who the viewer would be for the murals. And I think that's what makes a good mural. You know, um, there is a wonderful mural. In fact, I had done a documentary on my dad when I was in graduate school and we went out to the Marine um, Terminal and there was this wonderful mural. Um, oh, Joyce, help me out. Who's the artist of that mural? the one in um, LaGuardia Airport. I'm sorry, I don't know. Ah, Don't worry. Go yeah. <laughs> Lauren, my daughter's here. Quick, do a Google. <laughs> but it was- It's, it's uh, James, I'm sorry. It's um, James, um, he, he's from the- James the Brooks. West. Yeah, thank you. James mm -hmm. Brooks, right. And, and this was an incredible mural. It was 360 degrees showing kind of the history of aviation. So there, there again, there was a decorative aspect of it, but I think that I would say that most murals do have some kind of message behind them. Yeah. And, but not all, like it, you just, right, like right. Lee Krasna one, it, it's, it's really more, I don't want to, you could say decorative or it's abstract. It's 100% abstract. Um, but yes, typically, generally speaking, often they have some sort of message. You're right. Now, this is a very good question from Molly. Did your father ever share any of the prisoners' comments and thoughts? How was it received? Any ideas on that? Yeah, he, um, he said that they would come up to him while he was working on the ladder. And in fact, there's an article um, it's in the, I have archival materials in the exhibit, but I think I also put it on the website and this article, um, the, by Meyer Berger and what he did was interview the prisoners to get their reaction. Um, my father said that, that most of the reactions were good, but there was a time when he talked about mashed potatoes being thrown at it. So, so you know, there, there was both sides of this. Um, but he definitely 
was interested in the perspective of the prisoners in this. I think much more so than the administrators, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, on that note, Lisa, I want to give you a big thank you. We have so many wonderful um, compliments coming in of how much people enjoyed you. your presentation. And I do want to uh, reserve some time to give people some practical tips on things to think about when you're making a mural. And your father gave some really good advice there. So go to the website and read some of that advice. It, it still tolls true today, you know, about communication. And yes. What, just one last thing, I'm, I glanced down. In a word, every wall is a challenge. To meet it, we must marshal all our weapons, technical, psychological, social, individual, and aesthetic. To favor one and neglect others is to duck the challenge and not meet it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the really emphasis on the idea that this is a mural that's for people, it's going to communicate and it is going to be in that physical space and really um, understanding the needs of the public. But blending that with your viewpoints as well, that's why it's interesting. It's almost like being an illustrator where you have a specific task and the artist is going to fulfill that need. You're an artist in your own right as well. So we'll just navigate some of this discussion as I show you some of these images. Now, naturally, personally, myself as an artist, I wouldn't take a job to begin with if it went against my morals and values. Right. But you also have to pay attention to other people's needs. And sometimes there might be subtle differences that come up. So um, I'm not there's so much to talk about. Um, so I'll just show you really some of the artists who really inspired me as an artist working, um, going to School of Visual Arts in the 1980s, living and working in New York City. Um, Keith Haring is one of the artists I love because he brought art to the people. He literally would go into the subways and draw. Sometimes he was arrested. And his messages were very graphic and very easy to understand. So this is art for the people. This is a very famous mural that you could see on the um, highway from the highway in New York City. Crack is Whack, which is really an anti-drug mural. 1986. Keith Haring, when we talk about murals and similar to Harold Lehman, you often go from the mural art to poster art, because obviously these are both very um, accessible art forms, right? So Pollock, some of, somebody said, does it have to have a message? This one is really very playful, right? There's no political message. In this case, um, Haring made this poster which had a very serious message at the time of the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, which was largely ignored by the government. And many um, young people were dying of AIDS. And so this is, I think, a very good example of a mural that communicates a message, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, silence equals death. It communicates in a very clear graphic way, right? So when you do a mural, if you do want to have a message, the art of illustration is how do you communicate visually? And also how do you draw people into want to look at the mural, right? Or the poster. So this is Shepard Ferry. He does many um, different kinds of public art dealing with current issues, okay? So um, these are his posters that he made really addressing immigration and marginalized people. And he has done um, different kinds of artwork addressing school violence. And so the issues with Shepard Ferry's work are brought up to date. This is by JR and this is really amazing. Sometimes you can actually do a mural with a photograph that you can blow up and then adhere to a wall. So this is the unexpected canvas. It's above the border wall separating the United States and Mexico. And there's a huge photograph of the Mexi 
Mexican, uh, Mexican toddler, excuse me, looking down at the US side. Again, it's a very clear message communicating without words, right? And you can one, wonder, right? You can contemplate looking at an image like this. So now what I'd like to do is I'm gonna share with you as best I can some practical tips on creating murals. So, oh, well this, I'm sorry, this, uh, I didn't get to that yet. This was a mural project that was done um, in Soho following the you know, destruction of the stores following the murder of George Floyd uh, in, you know, when there was riots in New York City. So him and uh, along with a group of uh, people got permission to paint on these boarded up windows. So sometimes mural making, you don't have to be a professional artist you can get right in there and communicate your message, right? So this was a way of responding to a horrible situation, right? And giving people a means of expression and a means of communication for the issues that were important to them at that time. And there's many other examples of these, these murals. So the, uh, you might ask the question, I once did this with teens and they said, but does it actually make a difference? Nothing's gonna bring George Floyd back. Nothing's gonna bring Brianna back. I think that um, obviously I'm an artist. I think visual communication does make a difference. And I think that <laughs> if it didn't, people wouldn't pay millions of dollars to have 10 seconds of a commercial at the Super Bowl. So yes, the images we see impact the way we think. So for many years, I worked in schools prior to the pandemic and I did what's called character education murals is an example, um, working with the actual students to paint the murals. So I'm gonna throw out some tips as I go through these images. Tip number one is you cannot create a large mural literally physically painting it by yourself. You will be there for such a long time. This is a cooperative effort. So if you're planning on making a mural, you want to have people to actually physically help you paint the mural on the wall. And you want to have a plan in advance of how you can get a group to paint it. So we'll get back to that. Now, Tip number two, the school says they want a mural, okay? So you wanna make sure, just as Harold Lehman did, that your proposal is so crystal clear that they know what they're getting and they know what to expect because you don't want to, as the muralist, paint a mural if you're doing it for a school or another institution where you're being hired and commissioned you really don't wanna to have to backtrack because they're surprised that you put such and such a thing in, in the mural. Now, what I did is I would ask them to, I had a, a template of questions. What is your school slogan? What do you have a mascot? Do you have school colors? Things of that nature, right? And once I had that information, I would then put together a very detailed sketch or I maybe in some places gave them two sketches. So here's an example of the sketch. Now, in my case, I had so many examples, they had an idea that the colors would be bright, so they would have seen the portfolio in advance, okay? Now, this is important, a contract. My contract was so detailed, right? Once we agreed, you're gonna pay me this much money to make this mural, it was so detailed so that if they veered against away from the plan, I would get paid for my time, okay? So it said things like, I will submit this sketch and you get one revision. Any additional revisions after the one revision, there's an hourly fee. Does this make sense so far? Okay, other details. Who's responsible for priming the wall? These are all practical considerations. Right? If I come to the school during certain hours, 
and then you say, I'm sorry, I can't use the building because we have a fair going on. Am I gonna get paid for that mistake that was on your part? You really have to be very specific with all this because schools are busy or any people are busy, a lot can go wrong. The fee schedule, all the normal things you would put in a contract to make sure you get paid. A deposit, for example. So anyway, that being said, Sometimes like this one, this was tailor made, but after a while I used templates where I didn't have to start the whole process from scratch. Okay, which I'll show you later. Now pricing. I had a base fee for the mural, which was, this is how large the mural is. It's so many feet, right? And then anything outside of that, I actually charge by the square foot. Okay. Now, after the sketch was approved, right, I then would project the mural onto the wall. Here's something that could go wrong. You have your projector, right? Now, what happens if you pull the projector back, the hall is so narrow, you can't get it to be large enough. Does that make sense? You have to back up a projector in order to project it large. So you have to prepare for these things. Sometimes you might have to have more than one. You, I would do it in sections so it could be small, right? Rather than one image that I would think was gonna project onto this giant wall. Does that make sense? Okay. Then um, have adequate professional help. This was my assistant, Heba Soleil. And we would have the students painted in bit by bit. We use latex paint. And um, if you're going to work with students, be prepared. You need a lot of patience because they make a lot of <laughs> a big mess. It looks really neat, but that's towards the end of the mural. And we would have them use very small brushes so that the paint would not go all over. And we would show them how to handle a paintbrush. And um, basically, they're coloring, coloring it in. They're, they're being assistant painters, okay? Now, I did this with children as young as five, five years old or as old as 12th grade. And I would have them come up 10 at a time. Sometimes Laura asks, well, is it always on a wall? Sometimes like this one, I would do them on four by eight foot panels and this would lay flat on a table and people work, would work around the edges now, that's a lot easier because if you're working on a wall, you know, physically it's more challenging. You have to get up on a ladder and things like that. Also, it's, it's beneficial for the school or certain institutions. They could easily move it around, right? If the, the building gets renovated. Now, this is an example. After a while, I had this templated so I could easily change little things making it tailored made without starting from scratch. So like this one, I put the lighthouse in because this was in Greenport, Long Island. Now, you'll notice here when uh, Lisa talked about a so social message. And when I went into the schools, what inspired me is that there is character education in New York State. And they would have words on the wall like empathy or responsibility. And most of the time they had like pre-made pre posters um, or even just a word with no picture. And I thought, how would a five-year-old understand the idea of empathy or cooperation, these wonderful character words, if it's just printed on the wall with no picture? So I wanted to bring this, this to life and I also wanted to beautify the hallways, which a lot of schools have cinder block walls, as we know, that could be really oppressive for teachers and students. So that's what inspired me. Um, to, uh, it's basically the skill of illustrating, right? And what I would do sometimes is I would put in subtle messages that aligned with my values of social justice. So for example, in this particular case, you have the cheerleaders in a pyramid and an African-American girl is the leader, right? She's at the top. Sometimes I would show the ballerina 
would be African-American because so often, at least when I grew up, especially, the leader, the princess, so to speak, was blonde and blue eyed and, and white. Now, does anybody notice this? Does anybody care? Yes, actually they do. Because when you're working on a mural, you get to hear what people say as they walk by. And I would actually hear children say, gee, I never saw an African, a black ballerina, right? So where do I get the ideas from to serve the needs of the school? So I had a technique where I would work with the students give them the sayings, give them the words with these cutouts, and then they would work in teams to create these posters. And I would take pictures of the posters and then grab some of the ideas from their posters. So this is an example. I did this with a high school. This was a complex project. This was in Westbury. They had um, Three, they had uh, Haitian students, Hispanic students, and it was on Long Island in New York. So they wanted to combine English, Creole, and Spanish language. And they wanted this to ultimately get the community together. So here's an example where the students are tracing it. They're older, so they would trace the projection. We painted it. And this was a really great, this one you could see is on canvas. So this is an example of something that would not technically be attached to the building, but they could glue it on, they could frame it. And the design challenge with this is that they wanted this to be that every section could be cut, let's say sliced up into rectangles that could be made into posters and flags to hang around the town. So here's an example. If you sliced up that image that says hope, you'll get a poster, you see it on the right. If you sliced up that image with the black and white bird, you'll get a poster. So this was really fun. It was just a fun artistic challenge. And here are other details. What's nice about this is that um, a lot of the schools, I was surprised, actually they invited us to come back every year. They wanted more murals, like the East Hampton Elementary School. I did five murals over the course of five years. So that was a really pleasant surprise. So let me see what other tips I have. Communication is key as well as flexibility, right? So listening to what people's needs are and also learning how to communicate if you don't agree, okay? Learning how to set boundaries, okay? So that a boundary, so that you will not be taken advantage of or exploited as an artist, right? Your time is valuable. So you have to set boundaries in that contract. And learning how to communicate, sometimes it's a small, well, not a small, but it could be a detail. Like there was one school that had a logo that was so outdated, it had two white people on the logo. And the entire school was black and his, um, African-American and Hispanic. And I was like, how could I put this giant logo in this mural when there's not like, it's just doesn't, it's just not right people need to see themselves represented. So um, I think what I did is I kind of changed it around a little bit. Actually, in that case, I think I didn't tell them. I think I just put more people in and like blended it in a little bit. And, um, no, I really don't remember. But then there was another case. There was a mural where I always would put uh, someone using a wheelchair in every mural. It's a school, right? And then the principal says, take, take that boy in the wheelchair out. And I was really not happy about that, but I said, okay, you know what? I have to pick and choose my battles. So she's the principal, I'll let that one go. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, any questions about Felisa for any, for me, for any practical things, any thoughts? Joyce, I just want to say, I just love 
how you have brought mural art into a contemporary environment. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just so impressed with everything you just showed. It also reminded me when you said how important it is to have an assistant that I put in the chat, I forgot to mention Sandy, Jackson's brother was my father's assistant. <laughs> On the Rikers Island here. That's really, that's really interesting. <laughs> also, fun, a little fun fact back to Rikers. I actually went to Rikers Island not to be incarcerated. They actually have a, um, a school on Rikers Island for teenagers. It's a high school, sadly, that high school students are incarcerated. But they do provide an education. And I would go in and actually train the teachers of how to help the students have creative expression yeah. in prison. So now, I hope that this pro I hope that maybe they'll do a mural again in Rikers. Yeah. Now you talked about projections, which was again very much um, akin to what Sikatos did with the mural art. Um, the other thing that my father did, I don't know if you did it, was this kind of um, technique where he was just making like dots on the wall that he would then fill in. You, yeah, well, you know well, what I mean? We would, we would outline it with the yeah. paint so that it would, you would know what to fill. Yours, dad's was modeled, ours was flat. I see, okay. Yeah. So, so yes, but we did kind of lay out all the colors in advance. Also, right. at, just as a point of information, I forgot to mention this and I'm sorry, um, for the people, a practical thing. You can do also a mural where you enlarge the image with a grid, but that is really a lot more difficult where you say, here's a grid and it's the same proportion, but bigger. And then you look square by square, what would go in each grid. Also, what I forgot to mention is obviously when you do your sketch, you have to do it in the proportion of the mural and you do have to think ahead and say, okay, one inch equals one foot. And then you have to think ahead. Oh, so how big is that figure actually gonna be in real life? If it's four inches, oh, that's gonna be four feet. Is that actually big enough? Do you know what I'm saying? You have to, or this letter over here, this letter of the alphabet, how big is it actually gonna be in the mural, right? So all this takes practice. What I would encourage anyone who wants to do a mural is really jump right in. What the first mural I did, I learned a lot. I made mistakes, right? I, the paint was all dripping down. I didn't really realize like to teach the students how to really get it. So the brush, the paint doesn't drip, drip. It was messy. If that happens and you get lots of drips or you use, you know, you get, you got to go back in there with a knife and scrape it off and then paint over it or whatever. But don't wait until you're good at something to do it, just do it. Okay. I was trying to bring up the, to show everyone this other image. Okay. So this was kind of the technique that my dad used back in the day you know, again, just kind of drawing these outlines. That's and very then, cool. And then there was, then this, this, this is kind of cool because you can see the whole, what they called it was a cartoon mm -hmm. that they would do back in the day. Wow, and his was so large. That's an example of what I was saying. He had to do it in sections. Right, right, yeah. Just wanted to show that. No, thank you. Um, everyone, you know, there's so many, there's so many wonderful mural projects um, like the Philadelphia mural project and Cincinnati, there's murals all over the entire city. And it just brought to mind cause your father used those um, like sheets instead of painting it initially drawing it on the wall. And um, a lot of times when people do murals outdoors, like in the Philadelphia art projects, they don't do it directly on a building where you have to get up on a scaffold. They'll have people painted in on these sheets and then um, mount that. So do we have any burning desire for a question? 
Oh, well, somebody says, how do you, you would, you could project it onto the wall if it's done outside. I guess yeah. you, another thing is when you do use a projector, there is the aspect of light. You have to make sure that you get a projector that can project if it's, it's, if there's some light, right? I don't do murals outdoors because that's just too much for me. Like <laughs> there's too many variables. Um, but yeah, you can do the mural, as I said, and then mount it. Okay. Let's see one more message here. Okay, a lot of appreciation is coming in. Lisa, I wanna give you my biggest thanks. It was outstanding and I'm learning so much from you and learning so much from your father. I'm back well. at you, Joyce. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Again, I hope everyone will mark their calendars for our next one together, which is October 12th. And if you wanna learn more about the um, Pennsylvania post office murals. I think David's is on the 18th. I'm not 100% sure. You'll have to go to the Paula Krasner calendar to find it. Yeah, pkhouse.org. And yeah. um, Harold Lehman's granddaughter will be speaking about her work during that tribute. So I can't wait to see how this family creativity has evolved. So say hi, Lauren. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming and for your participation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I really appreciate it. It was wonderful. Have a good day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you.